Chapter 2 What no one really understands about Freud is that the Oedipal complex is only a historical motion, and just like Oedipus, we do not know that the Earth is our mother, and as such we feel no obligation to care for her, but instead only consume and fuck. We killed our father generations ago, whatever this energy was, is usually just called God. That is to say, if any of this is actually pronounceable. Whatever this mother and father were is probably something words and images can only lie about. We don't remember that everyone is at best a corner of the earth, and that our primary function in any kind of moving is only as a restyling of primordial carbon hair. We are literally the earth's bristles dancing for the wind's applause. We only ornament, not even. This implies separation and nothing can really be separate except for words. We all know this, but we pretend we don't remember. All of the meat used to be eaten only in groups, in shared feasts of whatever come togetherness a respective culture mythologized out of the beasts. I'm thinking now of a pig roast, an image I've seen countless times, but never experienced. Men carrying a pig with a face suspended on a stick between them, Weirdly, nothing is grisly to me about this image. It doesn't even feel like consumption. The roasting of the whole animal is so that it may be shared. This is why I found a steak so alien as a child. I couldn't tell what it was. Purple, not squares, sarin gleaning through gossamer, not plastic. I assumed it was synthetically created. Nothing in it looked like an animal, and nobody told me it was ever alive. It was just geometric to me. It's telling that the sound we use for it is steak, the same sound we use for burning witches or impaling vampires. A steak is what stabs the animal. With steak we eat, a murder, and no longer just a creature. <laughs> My family made fun of me when I said I wanted to stop eating meat. I loved pigs as a boy. I did not know what pastrami was until a pig told me at the fair. They would have these pig races there, on a little bleacher and track set up. All I remember from our county fair was the pig gambling, the alcoholic clowns, and the massive animatronic rat. I remember this too well. A cheesy mustard red striped tent, far too elaborate and glowing bulb sign that read, enter at your own bewares, world's largest and most dangerous rat. I had a fixation with rodents as a boy. I could somehow tell they were older and the earliest mammals but without those words, they always felt like grandparents. My parents had given me 20 tickets for the evening for food in which whatever we wanted to do. I was just as bad at budgeting then as I am now. I wasn't allowed to see the rat the first few times we went to the fair. My mother said I was too young and that I'd get nightmares. That's also why I couldn't watch most animated shows. I had frequent nightmares as a boy, specifically centered around clowns and rats. I suspect it's because of our annual fair trip. It was always brack muddy and scotch macabre around. The South has its own grotesque, and the event both captivated and horrified me. I remember that burning rubber and the pork belly fat smell thick in the air. It would have had to have been August. It was the time when summer starts to go to sleep. I would have been wearing pants. I remember sleeking away from my family in the gray dusk to go wait in the line for the rat. It was one of the longer lines at the fair, as it had the best marketing, and none of the other rides looked like they were even meant to be ridden. They just ornamented the fairgrounds to remind us of the whirling nausea that we were haplessly equating with recreation. No machine at a fair ever appears new. They're made with rust and grime stain baked in. That's what the people silently demand. But then, that terrible child feeling of tall shoulders in the bureaucratic and eyely lines. You stand behind some scandalous 20-year-old couple. You are face to face with a frauderizing denim ass hand, fondling some want before you. Every eye looks drunk around. The hollers only rise above the din, and you don't want to look up at the cackly face eyes. So you just stare down at the gray dirt or the denim butt. The fair is for adults and I've always felt too immature, immature to be there. Every face, when you look up, an anxious body jerk, 
responding to any hairy stimulus. Every face ripples in this laughed up chaos. I shoveled up through the gray dirt, watched the other spectators leave the shoddy tent. All the ones leaving weren't laughing anymore with the rest of the carnival. They didn't look stunned or disappointed either. Some paler look without much definition, a kind of unease, but without any tacit confusion to their subtlety in the grimace. The waiting in the line felt too long. I remember a haze of Pall Mall smelling smoke. Cigarettes made me think of skulls and death as a boy. It all felt like a scandal. All of us in a line, waiting to see this stupid mystery unveiled. It's as if the scientists had lied to us. This was the implication of the tent. Of all the taxonomy and of all the human adult knowledge, here upon these seedy and ignoble grounds, the truth which has been hidden is kept by bands of traveling gypsies. A creature never seen before to most square-minded boys my age. We had lived in a darkness where rats were only the size of a hand, but these eerie magi had preserved some line of primordial nature. It felt like I was entering a secret. I had always thought dragons were real. It's like that. This behemoth rat was to be my dragon, sat upon some ethereal treasure in Tenty Cave. I felt it was biblical somehow. As I got near the ruffle folding entryway of the tent, there was this gassy cinematic music guiding people in and a bald man with his baldness peeking out of one of those carny hats. He reeked of peanuts and soiled caramel, that stepped on candy smell that festive shoes shit out during any kind of circus. The last week of the fair has a particularly rotten saccharine air to it. It sticks in your gums. We would go every year. It was one of the few rituals we did as a family, and there aren't that many rituals to do anymore. The rat tent would let three people in at a time, so I went in along with a couple immediately behind me. I saw their faces before we cautioned inside the now glown tent. There was a faded and beat wooden stage facaded up by a patriotic themed gateway and neon lights shaped like bursting fireworks wrapping around the lanky siding of the pseudo theater space. The curtain was crimson. I suppose it had to be. I don't remember any chairs. I don't think we sat down. The ground had some shoe dust friction of quiet and old. You didn't ever truly step on the wooden platform floor. And then two fumes of smoke diagonally shoot out of the industry cannons beneath the stage floorboards. The gassy neon fades and a haunting calliope organ trickles from above. In fricative old grain box amps sat on the ceiling scaffold by those house lights. The tent rained cave drippings yellow and green of ghost spine noise and some memified dawn of Barnum and Bailey. Forgotten pirate music, struggling to remember its tinny channel in our dark little present. My back convulsed with a barbed wire inside it now. My mouth turned into a spooked fence blown open by the grainy wind dripping down. The rain in the room grew cold. My skin fleshed all goosey like a sterile hot dog in still water. The couple stopped their youthy grabs in the yellow dark. A smaller man around its smaller man like a little pretzel. Gallivants on stage in all shotted and musky purple. Some cane he was holding had a number nine billiard ball on its tip, and he had this dumb looking monocle to distract away from the mortician's makeup that hid his wrinkles in cakey white and almost pink, but not quite flesh color, a flapjacking circle encased in his sharp lines. He looked like a ruined pastry, like a Humpty Dumpty egg who only ever wanted to become a cake but that nobody wanted to eat. Perhaps food wants to be eaten, and we don't let it really talk. The purple egg man took our allotted fee. Twelve tickets, the price of a funnel cake. I still had ten. I could still get a funnel cake afterwards. The man took a specific poise right at the center head of the stage, the stance of a major announcement. He looked above our heads and proclaimed with a trumpeting pomp, 
Ladies and gentlemen, what you are about to witness may entirely shock you, may alter the fundamental chemistry of your every spinal cavity, turn all that is gray to white and all that is yellow red. You will see a creature not yet defined by the precepts of modern science. This magnificent beast, found deep within the emerald jungle lands of the mysterious Yucatan, only has been given the name Quetzalcar by the indigenous peoples of the swamp I rescued him from. There, along the malaria-ridden tranches and brown rivers, I saw his gleaming red eye peering through the muck towards me. I halted our canoe and retrieved the creature from his middened entrapment. He has been by my side, traveling the southern lands ever since. I must tell you before we proceed, if you are prone to fainting, the state of Georgia has suggested that you calmly exit the tent now. Eye contact with the Quetzalcar has been known to petrify the spirits of those uninitiated into the darker goings-on of this world. Without any furthering to do, however, I present to you Napoleon Ra, the living Quetzalcoatl, the only one in these great United States. And then the Eggman slunk off stage. More yellow-orangish smoke bellowed from the pits and turned gray around the center of the stage, where the two smoke streams converged, and through the curtain space crept out a hoggish cone of a face, bristle bracken gray with pink nose, that of a pig, twitch sniffing through the sulfur smoke, traffic cone-sized snout face bobbing absently mocking the hauntology of organ gristle. The head would bob and turn. It would stop at fixed points in its little staring semicircle. It would try to look at people. It almost made perfect eye contact with me, as it was just at my level. I couldn't tell if its eyes were red or black, however. When it bobbed up and down, it occasionally would vibrate out a belchy grunt, show its teeth and mouth and tusks. They were stained in a black oily substance meant to be a darker blood than my own. And the teeth were surprisingly reflective, not pearly but too shiny to have ever really eaten anything with bones. But it wasn't quite plastic either. I couldn't tell for moments if it was real or not. Obviously, I heard the grinding gear tram noise of its metal tracking being activated. It clinched with a rusty dirge creak of yellow steam every notch of its rotation. Most of his body, however, was kept out of view. There's always some ambiguity of some kind needed to make people, pe people feel alive. Especially if the parlor trick involves a mechanical beast. That's why people are only allowed to ride mechanical bulls at nighttime. And while I was trying to make eye contact with the strange beast, I remember this clattering little explosion of light around the fireworks display, flurries of static, unshapen, charring open in the salt dark air, rumbles of microscopic thunder, rattling the stage and revealing its iron beneath. And the man next to me, entranced by the commingling of the eerie spectacle and some daiquiri icy, fainted. And the woman screamed, turned to me, horrified. The Eggman hurried on stage, calm waving his palm, saying, Don't panic. It's going to be okay. She started crying. I looked forward in petrified face of boyhood. The curtain caught fire and green smoke curled around the stage. Some vomitous brown green of all the pointless gas gusting into one confused rising. And I just stood there. I didn't know where to move. And nobody told me how to move. So it was all kind of still somehow to me. The curtains burning unveiled the metal contraption holding the strange rat pig head up. It had hair only on the front side of it, and the back end was a brown brassy set of bars fixed upon a small track with a wooden stick from the inside of the head poking out of the back end of the scaffolding, making a handle to control the head. Next to the handle was a monitor, a screen, and glowing faded buttons of some tiny control center. And it was then that it made eye contact accidentally with me, its mouth tilted down in the lame stupor of mechanical failure, the curtain flame now bustling, melting whatever musky rubber the beast's face was into. A thick and silty resin of amniotic black oil stained the stage ground now beneath its grimace in a dense puddle of amber-yellow reflection as the minstrel ground burned slowly, I stared and my pupils turned as dark as the machines and my nose began to bleed.